just to clear something up, uh, my name's Mike, not Truman. Trevor. If, uh, Trevor. Truman. Uh, check in your uh, bulletin there. I couldn't resist. Matthew 21. We're going to read first 11 verses dealing with the triumphal entry of Jesus coming into the city of Jerusalem at the beginning of Passion Week. Beginning in verse 1, the Bible tells us as they approached Jerusalem, Jesus and his disciples, and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and, once, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was sp spoken through the prophet. Say to your daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus instructed them. That's a great verse. It says the disciples went and did as he instructed them. You know, if we just took that one verse out of all this and said, let's apply that to our life every day, boy, how much better would things be if we just did what he told us to do? Verse 7, they brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. Cloaks being the outer garment that they wore, Okay. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those who followed said, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Let's pray together for a moment. Heavenly Father, as you reveal yourself to us through your, your spoken and written word, Father, we pray that we would take this to heart, that each of us would walk away with something from your word this morning that makes us better imitators of Jesus. Bless the time that we have this morning. It's our prayer in Christ's name, for his sake. Amen. I know this is not Palm Sunday, um, but we're going to kind of talk about Palm Sunday. I know that's a week away. But we've got today, next week, and then the following week be that of Easter. And I wanted to deal with all three of the significant events that happened during that week. The triumphal entry as Jesus is making his way into Jerusalem for the final time. He's been there before. But this is the final time he will approach the city of Jerusalem. His three-year ministry is coming to a close. His first 30 years spent in relative obscurity. But he has become very, very popular over the last three years. And he's coming into Jerusalem at the time of the Passover. So that's what we're going to concentrate on today. But how things would change so dramatically in just a short few days. That being the where he was seized, arrested that Thursday night, and crucified on Friday, and then came Sunday. So his arrival into Jerusalem, the crucifixion, and the obvious resurrection of Christ. And we're going to talk about each of those things today. Next week, we'll be talking about the crucifixion, a message that I have entitled, The Characters of the Crucifixion. And we're going to pick four 
individual people that played a part, played a role in the crucifixion of Christ. And then finally, on Easter Sunday, once we've done our Easter music that morning, we'll be looking at the fact that he's risen. And that makes all the difference. All the difference. But to talk about the triumphal entry, this is a message I've entitled, Give That Man the Key to the City. Now, y'all know I'm a big Andy fan. Andy Griffith fan. There's an episode called Guest of Honor. And it's an episode where a stranger comes into town and the town council, so to speak, has decided in order to give improved Mayberry's reputation and they wanted to be known more as a friendly city, welcome to all, they decided they were going to welcome the first out-of-town car and person, go to the city limits, and the first out-of-towner that they didn't know, they were going to make that person their guest of honor for the day. And sure enough, here comes this fellow. His name's Thomas A. Moody. <coughs> and they stop him. Well, he's not such a great guy, but they don't know that, Okay. He pulls up in his car. He was actually getting run out of the town uh, up at Mount Pilot. He got ran out of there because he was a criminal. But they don't know. So they welcome him in. And they take him into town, and there's this big celebration. And he's the guest of honor, and they make this statement, and they have a key. They said, Mr. Thomas A. Moody, we present you with the key to the city of Mayberry. Everything we have is yours. Not a good plan. Okay? That's kind of what's happening here. Well, with the exception of Thomas A. Moody was a criminal and Jesus wasn't, although he was treated <coughs> like one later. He's coming into town. People are everywhere. <clears throat> the city is crawling with people. And in getting prepared for this message, uh, in some of the research that I did, I saw where there were estimates anywhere from several hundred thousand up to two, two and a half million people in and around Jerusalem that week for the Passover. Now, just calling it like it is, Jerusalem in that time was not built for two million people. Don't have any idea where they all were. Where'd they put them? guessing they all slept outside because it was a week-long deal. He's coming into town with all these people and he's being praised. He's at the height of his popularity. Okay? And they're saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay, the Andy equivalent of that event would be, here, Jesus, we're giving you the key to the city. That's what it looked like at the beginning of the week. But things changed. As I said, in my story about Andy, one was a criminal. The story about Jesus, one wasn't. But he was treated like one. Four points I want to make real quickly this morning. Number one is found in verse, verse one. God uses seemingly unimportant pe people and places in his overall plan. He uses what seems to us to be <coughs> unimportant people and unimportant places to accomplish his plan. Verse number one. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples. Beth Page. Pretty um, obscure town. It was in the Mount of Olives. It was north, really, of the city. Never mentioned in the Old Testament. It's the only reference of this 
small town or village in the New Testament is associated with his triumphal entry into the city. We don't know anybody else that lived there, came from there. So what's the significance of this obscure, sleepy little village? Closely related to Bethany. We know about Bethany. We hear about it because that's where Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived. But Bethpage, we don't really know anything. It's claim to fame. In verse 2, there's a donkey and a colt that are tied up in that little town. And Jesus is going to send two of his disciples to go get that donkey, the mother, and the colt and bring them back. That's all we know about that little town. But yet, from that obscure place comes something that mattered from then on to this day. Okay? I want you to close your eyes a second. I want you to think of a picture that you have seen either in a Bible or a Sunday school book or something a picture of Jesus riding in to Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. You remember that? You remember that picture that's in your mind from that? That's the role this little town played. Here we are, 2,000 years later. <coughs> and God used that place and those people to accomplish part of his overall plan. You know, coming to Jerusalem, on the way in, he had encountered two blind men in Jericho, healed them. He'd also had the encounter with Zacchaeus. You know, he climbed up the sycamore tree, but he came down and he found salvation in Christ. And he makes his way into Jerusalem. The other thing that I think is worth mentioning is that Jesus knowing, okay, six days away, but Jesus knowing what was about to happen, he stops and he spends some time with Mary and Martha and Lazarus at their house. Knowing what was before him, he chose to hang out with some very close friends of his. And relax. No one. He knew. Six days, this is over. In five days, or four days, this thing's blowing up. None of this caught him by surprise. He even told the disciples, but they didn't get it. Okay? It blows my mind to think about he's just enjoying time with his friends when he knew what lay before him. He's entering that final act that the Heavenly Father has given him to fulfill his mission, okay, as Jesus on the earth. God will use seemingly unimportant people and places. You want to know a relatively obscure place that God will use? How about Eden? Okay. Think that qualifies? Is it Memphis? No. Uh, let's see. Y'all were in Nashville this uh, Friday. Is it, is it Nashville? Mm -hmm. No. It's not even Hernando. It's Eden. This is a small, relatively obscure place to most people. But God is using us. You get it? He's using us where we are as part of his overall plan that part of that plays out here 
all the way to the back of the book. I mean, the great part about that is we get to be a part. He used folks like us in places like here as part of his overall plan. Next point I want to make is in verses 2 through 7. It says this, that God always fulfills his prophecies and his promises. Never once, and not once, has God not fulfilled a prophecy. Everything that was prophesied to happen up to this day in all of Scripture has been fulfilled. Now, there are some that are still to be fulfilled in the second coming of Christ. But he always fulfills his promises and his prophecies. Verse 2. Go to the village ahead of you, and once you find a donkey tied there with coat by her, untie them and bring them to me. See, Jesus is always in control of everything that affected his life and ours. That's his omniscience, that's his omnipotence. And he knew what was ahead when he sent two disciples to this small, obscure village to get a donkey and a colt and bring them back. Now, what's so great about that? Well, it fulfills a prophecy that was given 500 years before that that's found in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Let me share this with you. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. That's a direct reference to the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was often called the city of Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. You think they were shouting that day? They were. Hosanna to the highest. In the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. See, your king comes to you. Righteous. And victorious. Lowly. And riding on a donkey, on a colt. The foal of a donkey. That's a prophecy. 500 years before it ever happened. It's coming true on this day. In this event that we're talking about right now. Those animals were not in sight of where they were. Yet he knew where they were. He knew that they would be questioned about just going and getting the animals, the donkey and the colt, and untying them and bringing them back. So he prepared them for that. He said, if anybody asks you, you just tell them that the Lord needs them, and they'll let you, let you have them. Now, that is not detailed in Matthew, but it is in Mark and Luke. And it also tells us that, about this colt, that it was untamed, it was unbroken, it was also unridden. That being a direct reference back to Jesus' birth when he was born, what? Of a virgin. Born of a virgin, he would ride on the back of a colt that had never been ridden. Now, the other thing about a colt that had never been ridden, anybody ever tried to do that? Okay. That's fun, wasn't it? No. <laughs> yeah, they don't behave. You know, donkeys are stubborn, right? If they don't want to go, they're not going to go. And if you put, sorry, if you put somebody on the back of one that's never had anything or anyone on their back, what are they going to do? Probably kick, butt. You're nodding your head, that's what happens? Okay, I'm taking your word for it, because I've never done that. <laughs> Not likely to start today. The other thing that is so cool, when you don't think about it. This colt's there, but the mama's there. Why? Well, you know how babies are, right? Okay? I'll use our family. 
Take a little map. If one of y'all decided you wanted a whole map, and you just walked over there to take him, is he likely to go to you? Probably not. He might sometimes. <clears throat> but if you go over there and you get his mother to come, guess what? He's happy as a little clam to go then, right? Same thing with this cult. There was no resistance whatsoever. And they were asked, by the way, and they gave the answer that the Lord needs them. And they left without any issue. So judging from their response, I would say that they were probably believers. They were aware of who Jesus was. As I said, it was a fulfillment of prophecy. But even though it's a fulfillment, it still seems just not right. It seems inappropriate that the Messiah, the king, who they believed to be their future king, that he would come riding into town where there's two, maybe, two million people hanging out, and he's going to ride in on a dog. Doesn't make sense. But you see, he didn't come to reign in an earthly way then. It's not why he came. They thought it was. They wanted it to be. They thought he should come in probably on a white horse, a chariot. But that wasn't his intention. He didn't come for wealth. He came in poverty. He didn't come in splendor. He came with surrender. He didn't come to destroy Israel's enemies being the Roman Empire. He didn't come to destroy anything. He came to save all of mankind. That's why he came. Now I know in 1 John that it also says that he came to destroy the devil's work. But in the context of what's happening right here, he didn't come to destroy. He came to save. One time for him to be glorified, although they were trying. He came to be humiliated. In verses 6 and 7, Jesus, being born of a virgin, came in riding on the back of a donkey that had never been ridden. Prophecies fulfilled. And it's seemingly being praised, but they don't even know Third thing I'll mention, we got to praise God for who he is, not for who we want him to be. Careful with that one. It's real easy to be guilty of that one and not even really be thinking about it, being aware of it. We've got to praise him for who he is, not who we want him to be. They didn't know that. They didn't understand that. Verses 8 and 9. A very large crowd split, spread their cloaks out on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went ahead of him and those who followed, and meaning those in front of him, those behind him, he's surrounded. And they're saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, we just talked about what were they looking for him to do? They wanted him to overthrow Rome and make their lives easier. Okay? And it says that they began to take their outer garments off and put them on the ground for this cult and donkey in procession to walk over. Others were taking palm branches, putting them down there. In Revelation chapter 5, we won't turn there, but it talks about the, also in John chapter 11, talks about 
the significance of palm branches, which symbolized salvation and joy, both of which were found in Christ at that time. But they didn't understand why. People are everywhere. And we all know what happens when you get a mob together, right? You get a few people, maybe they're not profile people, but mostly maybe just loud people. And they get something going, and guess what? It starts to catch fire. It gets louder, and it gets louder, and it gets louder. And the cause for many of them doesn't even matter. We've all seen the news clips of what happens over in the Middle East when mobs get together. And people just seem to get caught up in the hysteria of it. That happened here. It happened here. But you see, the mob, although celebrating his arrival. They weren't interested in him saving their souls. <clears throat> Only in saving their nation. They missed it. They wanted the dominant military power. But they didn't get that. Oh, they ultimately got the overthrow of Rome, but they didn't get it the way they thought. He did it through love, not through a military action. They wanted him to come with a mighty army, and you know what he brought? A ragtag bunch of fishermen and ordinary guys. That's who he brought with him. Not exactly who they were looking for. They wanted Jesus on their own terms. And I think a lot of people today do the same thing. You want an example? Just look at people that think being associated with Christ will bring them health, wealth, success, happiness, etc. Who doesn't want that, right? And they're all on the Jesus bandwagon. And God, I, I'm going to tell you, folks, there's hundreds of thousands of people in our country that believe that and are worshiping today, today at this moment. And that's their attitude. But when things get uncomfortable, when confronted with their own sinfulness, and it becomes uncomfortable and unpopular, they turn away. That's what happened to this crowd. They turned away. See, these folks thought the Romans were their greatest enemy. But the truth is, their greatest enemy was their own pride and their own sinfulness. And they refused to be delivered from that. Their words were right, but their hearts were wrong. Jesus didn't come to be crowned. He came to be crucified. And in Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, we read that he will one day be crowned, fittingly so. And it says this, that in that day, every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. That means everyone in heaven, on earth, and under the earth will acknowledge that he is Savior and he is Lord. First time he came, he came to bring salvation. The next time he comes, he's bringing sup supremacy with him. That will further fulfill the scriptures. The last thing I'm going to mention is people are still confused today about the real reason Jesus came. Some don't want to know. Some don't think they need to know. 
But Matthew's gospel, now Mark and Luke's gospel give a little bit more information in certain places than Matthew, uh, but it's, this account is in all four gospels. But in Matthew's gospel, we note in the last two verses just a little bit of a change to where you can kind of see things are going to go a different direction the rest of the week. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And the answer was, This is Jesus, the prophet. The prophet. Five verses before that, he's the king. Now, he's the prophet. The tide's already turned. We're going to talk about that next week. Like their forefathers. They heard, but they didn't believe. They saw, but they didn't understand. They heard the message, they saw the miracles, but they would not accept him. As the king, he was coming as. They rejected him. They wanted to accept him as an earthly king, but they rejected him as a heavenly king. Now, I'm going to submit to you that there's a lot of people today that do it just the other way around. I'll give you an example. Is confidence in knowing that Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of our sin and that makes us able to go to heaven when we die? That's good, right? Okay, this is where you go. Okay. What about the other way? How can you believe in him enough that he can get you to heaven, but you don't believe in him enough to make a difference in your life today? He can do that, but he can't do this. He can't solve the problem I'm in the middle of today. Just a theory. We don't have enough faith in him to get us through the way. Maybe we didn't have the kind of sincere faith we need that will get us to heaven one day. I just don't think there's enough consistency there that uh, when I die, I'm going to heaven. If I rejected his leadership in my life all the way up to that point, it doesn't add up. Doesn't make sense. But a lot of people live that way. Because, see, it doesn't cost us anything, so to speak, today to say, I accept him and I exercise faith in him to get me to heaven. To trust him today on how I'm going to make my rent by the end of this month or the beginning of next month. You got to get skin in the game with that. But you can say, heaven when I die, because that's a long way off. We got to make sure they match it. Amen? Amen. Thomas A. Moody was given the key to the city in Mayberry. Jesus was kind of given the key to the city in Jerusalem. And things went south. Let me tell you about another key he's got. It's found in Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. Let me share that with you real quick. Jesus said, fear not. For I'm the first and the last, the living one. I was alive but I, yet I died, and behold, I am alive now and forevermore. And I hold the keys to death and hell. The translation of your Bible may say death and the grave. Give that man the key to the city that he's already got. 
the keys. That allows us to spend eternity in heaven. So my question to you this morning is simply this. Do you trust him enough to lead your life today? And go to heaven when this life is over. If your life was to end today, would you have a triumphal entry into heaven or a tragic exit to hell? There's no in between. I'm just asking you to be honest with God this morning because believe it or not, he's going to be really honest with us one day. Let's not be like folks in that crowd. Let's accept him for who he is, not who we want him to be. He holds keys. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this count of Jesus going into such a large crowd of people who he knew would turn on him in a matter of days. And yet he loved us enough. He was obedient, yet even to the cross. Father, it's our prayer this morning that we would be obedient in that which you have given us to do. Whatever that part of the mission is, that we play, that we participate in, right here in Enid, Mississippi. We pray that we would be a place where others could find Jesus. That's our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. We have an invitation here. Uh, let's see, number 435.